Baruch Maboyim. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our house. Um, again, thank you for attending. The um, This week we're going to begin a two-part series uh, about the spies. Now, again, the topic this week and the next of my thoughts will be about the 12 spies that Moshe sent to spy out the land of Canaan. Now, since the story of the spies plays such a, a major part in the birth and development of the Jewish nation, I felt that one lecture would not be able to fully examine and comprehend the importance of this event in the history of our nation. I believe that it is common knowledge that the Jewish nation were slaves in Egypt and that they wandered in the desert for 40 years. I would bet, though, that if you were to ask people why the children of Israel were sentenced to travel in the desert for the 40 years, their reply would be, after all, they made the golden calf. If someone were to ask you, which of the two sins was more egregious, making a golden calf just 40 days after they received the Torah from God Almighty himself on Mount Sinai, or, or being influenced by the negative report that the ten spies brought back about the land, which would you choose? Now, serving idols is one of the most grievous sins that a person can transgress. In fact, it's one of what we call the three cardinal sins that one is obligated to give up their life for. So the question that we have to ask is, how can you compare to being misled by the report of the spies that the spies presented in believing that it was true? After all, the spies were all special individuals. You know, the Torah refers to them as princes, leaders of the people. They, they were not chosen by Moshe. No, they were chosen by the members of each tribe to represent them and to testify as to what they would observe on their journey. So the fact that people would believe the spies and their report is really only logical. So we have to ask, who were the spies who were traveling in the desert? For the most part, they were born as slaves in Egypt. They were bricklayers not trained soldiers, excuse me, not to spies, but to Jews uh, who were traveling in the desert. Who were they? Okay, for the most part, they were slaves that were born in Egypt. They were bricklayers, not trained soldiers. They knew nothing about the art of war. Somehow they felt that God expected them to conquer the land that was inhabited by giants. Now, granted, Yoshua had de defeated the Amalekis, that had attacked them while they were in the desert on their way to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. <clears throat> so, so why didn't that fact help give the people confidence that they would be successful in their quest to conquer the land and defeat its inhabitants? You know, when Moshe told Yeshua to choose men to battle against Amalek, he instructed him to choose only those men that were righteous individuals, the cream of the crop. Most of the people were not on such a high spiritual level and did not participate. The people were plagued with doubts and insecurities, and somehow they really never felt themselves worthy of God's miracles. Initially, they even had issues with Moshe and his leadership. It wasn't until they crossed the sea that the Torah stated that they believed in God and in Moshe, his servant. Granted, they were victorious against Amalek, but that was seen as just another miracle performed by God for the righteous members of the people. The Medrash tells us that though Yoshua was able to defeat Amalek, he was only able to weaken them, not destroy them. That would only occur in the future that a king of Israel would have the ability to destroy them completely. The proof that it was God and not their military prowess that won the battle was that they were only able to kill out the strongest of the Amaleki. The weak survived, something that went completely against the laws of nature. It was miraculous. We read that God told Moshe to send men to Yosser Esauretz to spy out the land. Rishmol David Lazaro states that the difference between the word in Hebrew, La Sur, and the word La Ragel which both describe the act of spying. When someone comes to Lasur, they are searching, trying to find positive attributes. On the other hand, when someone comes to be Miragil, well, their purpose 
is to find negativity in faults. So God told Moshe to send men for Yasuru. God's intent was for them to witness firsthand the many attributes that the land possessed. But as Moshe testified in the portion of Devarim, and they came until the valley of Eshkel and Vayaroglu, and they sought out all that was negative in the land. You know, the Torah or states, come and see what great power lies within the sight of evil. Just ten men succeeded in turning hundreds of thousands of their brethren away from believing in the power of God. Just ten individuals caused an entire nation to be blinded to the Torah perspective. Notwithstanding the fact that they had recently experienced personally the many miracles of the exodus from Egypt, the crossing of the sea, and the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. You know, even if they somehow had managed to forget these many and great miracles, still, for over a year, they had experienced daily the heavenly food that fell from heaven, the well of Miriam, a sea of water, and the clouds of glory that enveloped them on all six sides. That is in addition to the seventh cloud that gave them heat and light at night and led the way for them as they traveled through the wilderness. The spies were all great men, as the Torah testifies. The Torah says that, call Nasi Behem, each one, every one of them was a prince. The Hebrew word Nasi can be broken up into two Hebrew words, Yesh and Ayin. The word Yesh means something, and the word Ayin means nothing. So if you think that you are a yesh, a something, then in reality you are a nothing. But if you think that you are an ayin, a nothing, then, then you are a something. Moshe sent the spies to the south. It says to spy out the land of Canaan. But, but why did he instruct them to begin their journey in the south? God told Moshe in the portion of Achiv, not because of your righteousness are you coming to possess the land, but because of the wickedness of the nations. So Moshe sent the spies to the south, the side of holiness, to ascertain whether the nations of the land had sunken to the level of evil, where God would then drive them out. So, so for the spies to be able to assess the spiritual level of the inhabitants, they themselves would have had to have been on a very high spiritual plane. It's interesting that Rashi states that they were all Kesheru, honorable men when they left. Yet later, again, some 23 verses later, after the spies return, he comments on the words, Vayelchu vayavohu, and they went and they came. There Rashi states, what is the meaning of they went and they came? It is compared to their going, the key is comparing their going to their coming. And just as their coming, returning was with evil counsel, so too their going was also with evil counsel. Now Rashi is teaching us a, an important lesson. Evil thoughts do not necessarily make someone evil. In order for that to be the case, they must be connected to an action. So when the spies left, they were still righteous individuals, even though they had evil thoughts. The fact that they followed those thoughts, huh, that is what made them evil. If you look at what the spies said about the land, it seems really positive. They told the people that it was a land flowing with milk and honey, and that this is its fruit. To prove their point, they brought back with them one cluster of grapes. Now the cluster was so heavy that it took eight grown men to carry it. In addition, they brought back only one fig and one pomegranate, since that was all that one man could carry. Well, this sounds pretty impressive. But then they continued. But the people that live in the land are fierce and their cities are fortified and very large. In addition, we saw the children of the giants there. They intimated that just as the fruit of the land was unusually large, hmm, so too were the people that resided there. They mentioned that the Amaleki lived in the desert. Rashi states that the spies mentioned Amalek to intimidate the people. After all, they had been attacked by Amalek when they first left Egypt. They perceived the Amalekite as a strong and fierce nation, and yet the Amalekite lived in the worst part of the land. 
which could only mean that the other nations in the land were even stronger and fiercer. Otherwise, why would they live in the desert? So at first they just intimated their opinion, but then in verse 31, they stated it again, loud and clear. We are not able to go up against the people of the land since they are much stronger than we are. They finished off their assessment with the words, it is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the men that we saw there were men of great stature. They again alluded to the giants and they said again in verse 33 that they were in our own eyes as grasshoppers and so we were, so we, we, so we were in their eyes. The Alka Shimoni teaches us, you should, he teaches us, you said that you saw yourselves as grasshoppers? God said, who told you that in their eyes you did not appear as angels? When people lose their self-esteem and regard themselves as less than they really are, well, they automatically feel that others see them in much the same way. Life is more often than not based on perception, not reality. If you think you're going to lose, well, guess what? You are going to lose. Even before the spies told the people that it was a land that devours its inhabitants, the people were able to read between the lines. They understood by the choice of the words that the spies used in their report, such as the Hebrew word ephes, which means nothing or zero. In addition to the description of where the nations lived, they said that ephes, that there was no way that they would be able to succeed in conquering the land. You know, there are many lessons that we learn from the incident of the spies. First and foremost, the last thing that Moshe told the spies to observe was the land and its produce. But here, the first thing that they say is that it is a land flowing with milk and honey. What do we learn from this? That in order for a person to say a big lie, they must first be able to establish credibility. So they began by praising the land. It was only later in their report that they spoke Lush and Hara, an evil report about the land. They poisoned the hearts of the people, which was exactly what they had intended to do. You know, there's a logical reason as to why liars begin their lies with a bit of truth. Liars are, by their very nature, evil. Our sages tell us that evil people are full of regrets. Since every liar recognizes the evil within himself, he initially entertains some sort of guilt. He feels a certain degree of uncertainty. So his conscience compels him to begin his conversation with some truth. In this way, he delays committing his evil deed, at least temporarily. It also gives the liars a solid foundation to build their lies upon. You know, the spies told the greatest lie of all. They lied to themselves. They had convinced themselves that what they were doing was in the best interest of the people, when in reality it was influenced by what was best decision for their own self-interest. Our mission in this world is to follow God's directive and not to try to second guess what we think might be a better choice. Well, next week we will continue to look a little deeper into the incident of the spies. We will observe as to how even the punishment that a benevolent father administers to his children is always for their benefit. And with that, may we help to usher in the coming of Asiya Tsukena quickly and in our time. Again, thank you for listening. Thank you for attending. Uh, we bless you all with the happiness, health, and safety. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. Again, thank you for attending.